Bhagavadevasudevaya. Hare Krishna, dear devotees, uh, thank you for joining us. I um, wanted to seek your good wishes and your blessings so that we can share some glories of the Srimad Bhagavatam, especially in, specifically in regard to Bhakti Yoga today. We wanted to look at uh, Bhakti Yoga, how it, how it is, comes in the third canto in so many different ways. And we wanted to seek the blessings of uh, Srila Prabhupada, Guru Maharaj, Guru Parampara, so that we can uh, learn a little bit more about the Bhagavatam and the contents of the Bhagavatam, uh, so that we can please Sri Sri Radha Krishna and Gornitai and Krishna Balaram. So uh, today we wanted to focus on uh, Bhakti Yoga. Um, Bhagavatam repeatedly emphasizes Bhakti Yoga is the best path that reconnects us, the conditioned living entity, we're conditioned by the three modes of material nature, and we are sort of stuck in this world. But it, it can connect us, reconnect us to the Supreme Lord, Krishna. The supremacy of Bhakti Yoga of, over other parts, other yogas, such as Astanga Yoga um, or Jnana Yoga, is in uplifting the soul, is repeatedly established in the Bhagavatam. So we've done a list of uh, selected verses from the third canto that glorifies the path of uh, bhakti. And we've tried to categorize it in different sections. So we've only sort of gone into the themes of the verses, not actually gone into, you know, not reproduce the verses because that would just take a little bit too long. But we just wanted to get a, a idea at a glance uh, the value of bhakti yoga. And, and what is bhakti yoga in the first place? Bhakti yoga is where we focus our attention on the Supreme Personality of God, Sri Krishna, on his personal form through chanting uh, the Maha Mantra, through reading the Bhagavad Gita, the uh, Bhagavad Puran, the um, uh, Chaitanya Church I mean, and other books that Shri Prabhupada has specifically written. And we, we listen to um, uh, lectures on, on, on Krishna consciousness. We uh, include also worshipping the Supreme Lord through Arti, um, Tulsi Arti, Gaur Arti, all the different Arti. So Bhakti Yoga is quite a wide range of different activities. Uh, which all culminate into this uh, umbrella of uh, Bhakti Yoga. So, Bhakti Yoga awards um, uh, the award of the Lord. And devotees with a serious attitude, they attain Vaikuntha. So this is like, uh, I've got the reference of the verses here. And uh, of course, I'll share this uh, at the end uh, uh, with uh, the devotees. So, you will have the re references of the verses which are, uh, these are all coming from. So this is from Canto 3, text, sorry, chapter 5, text 46. It elevates one to the highest perfectional stage. So this is what bhakti does. So it's not to be uh, underestimated. What bhakti can do, it can transport us to the to Golok Vrindavan, the highest perfectional stage. The Lord takes them, the ones who perform bhakti, beyond birth and death. Yeah. Okay. The devotees don't have desire for Satyalok. Satyalok is where Lord Brahma lives, Asta Siddhis, or even Vaikuntha <laughs> in the spiritual world. But still, the Lord awards them his own abo abode, no abroad, uh, abode. And uh, that is 325.37. So even devotees don't uh, necessarily desire to attain the spiritual world because as far as they're concerned, they're already in the spiritual world because they're remembering Krishna. They're with Krishna. They're associating directly with Krishna. So they're already in the spiritual world. So why aspire for something that you already have? <laughs> but anyway, still the Lord gives them. 
So next sub topic is liberation. Liberation means um, coming out of this cycle of birth and death that we're stuck in perpetually. In spite of the unwillingness, devotees attain liberation without separate endeavor. So when you do bhakti yoga, that includes uh, the reward of liberation automatically. Just like a, in a 50 pound note, 20 pounds is already there. So when we do bhakti yoga, all the other processes are already automatically included. And also all the rewards coming out of the other processes are already included. Don't have to endeavor for them separately. Makes it possible to advance in knowledge and detachment as well as in self-realization. So when we do bhakti yoga, um, automatically there's an advancement in knowledge, automatically we become a little bit detached from uh, the madness in this world. And um, of course, self-realization manifests. What are the opulences, transcendental opulences? It's right. Bhakti yoga, one who does it, time cannot destroy the transcendental opulences that the devotees receive. I.e., when one does bhakti yoga, you will never lose that. It stays with us forever. Even if it's a little bit, that will always be with us. And it will always be giving us some protection from um, material nature. So even a little bit of bhakti can uh, have such a huge impact on our lives. Nothing is impossible for one who takes shelter of the Lord. Right? So this is where we give ourselves to the Lord and he, he can make anything happen. Like we were discussing about yesterday, Srila Prabhupada, <laughs> you know, the odds were completely stacked against him. He was facing, uh, you know, materialism at its uh, worst, going to America and, uh, you know, what hope <laughs> one old man who wasn't even really that well <laughs> what chance did he have to do what he did? Zero, you could say. But nothing is impossible for one who takes shelter of the Lord. And he used to say, impossible is a word in the fool's dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> so I must admit, I could do with a bit of help with this because uh, at the moment I'm trying to summarize uh, uh, Shivaram Maharaj's book and it's like uh, even to do one page is taking like uh, hours, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm almost at this stage where this is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> but of course it's not. Uh, just have to keep on persevering. Okay, love for the Lord. Um, one surpasses the three uh, modes of material natures, the gunas. Does anybody know what these gunas are? I want to pick on somebody. Rohit. What are the gunas? He may not be around. Eh? Uh, Rianch, actually. Rianch. What are the gunas, Rianch? You better be around. <laughs> yes, Prabhuji. Mode of goodness, more of passion, more of ignorance. Well wow. done, Rianch. Phenomenal. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> One surpasses these three modes, goodness, passion, ignorance, sattva gun, raja gun, tamagun, and atten, attains prema, uh, which is love for Krishna, love for the Lord. The Lord is never separated from the lotuses of the hearts of the devotees. So he's always, that's where he lives, in the hearts of the devotees quickly dissolves the subtle body of living entities without any separate endeavor. So the subtle body is, okay, what is a subtle body? Anybody like to tell me? What is a subtle body? What does it consist of? Prabhuji, false ego. No, 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 no. I know you know, you know, you know. <laughs> Um, Aruna, I'm going to pick on you, if you don't mind. <laughs> I have no idea. My mind is 
become blank. <laughs> okay, what is blank? Tell me what is blank. Mind. Yes, that's one. Well done. <laughs> mind. Excuse me, Prabhuji, can I tell something? No, not yet. <laughs> Just wait. Patience, young man, patience. Okay. Um, Kaushalya. Yes, Prabhuji. What is a subtle body? Subtle body. Do you remember? What is a gross body? Is the is the with the flesh and everything? Yes, earth, water, fire, air, ether. Yes, Those five elements of the gross body. What do you think the subtle body is? It's just the bones, I think. No, no. <laughs> subtle means you can't see it. Okay. There's three things, and Aruna's already got one: mind, intelligence. Yes, and ego. Ego. Okay. Okay, Rianch, what did you want to say? Prabhuji, I want to tell you that Brahmas are mode of goodness, mm. mode of passion, and Vaishyas and Shudras are mode of ignorance. Actually, Vaish are uh, predominantly passion. Sorry, Prabhuji, uh, Vaishyas are mode of passion and ignorance. Yeah but predominantly passion and ignorance is shudra and also kshatriyas are predominantly passion but they also can have some satogun okay yeah and uh, brahmans are qualified brahmans are always satogun so what was the okay so this bhakti yoga can dissolve this subtle body of ours this subtle body stays with us life after life and the idea is we need to uh, transcend the subtle body as well. Mind, intelligence, and ego. Those three things. By hearing about the quali Lord's qualities, um, the mind flows continuously to the Lord and unobstructed. Such bhakti is causeless and uninterrupted. So this is um, the effect of bhakti. Hearing Krishna Katha in association of devotees will give ruchi, which is taste, ashakta, which is attachment, bhav, which is devotional sentiment, emotion, and prema, which is love. Then we will look at how bhakti is the best process. So these are the different elements in third canto, which describe bhakti as the best process. Perfection is self-realization cannot be attained unless one engages in bhakti. So even if we are endeavoring for another path, perfection in self-realization can only take place when we are in bhakti. There's no greater person than he who has no interest outside of the Lord. The Lord is perceived only through unfailing devotional service, bhakti. Tivra bhakti, tivra bhakti, tivra bhakti. That's, that means um, intense, intense bhakti. Because we, we uh, Kapilda was talking about intense bhakti is the only means for attaining attainment of the final, uh, final goal of life, profession. I'm not sure about profession. Final goal of life. So our bhakti, at some point, it has to be very, very intense. Intense means nothing else is our focus except this bhakti, nothing else. What else does it do? It removes miseries. So these are the examples from the third canto. As long as people of this material world do not take shelter of your lotus feet, they are full of anxieties. Of course, it doesn't mean that spiritualists are not full of anxieties. Srila Prabhupada, if you'd asked him, do you have any anxieties? I'm sure he would have said lots, all the way throughout his whole life. But it was always in connection with devotion, 
in connection with bhakti, in connection with Krishna. So that is a different type of misery or anxiety, sorry. These anxieties, which are uh, as a result of uh, being associated with the material world, are, are temporary anxieties which can bring us further down in this material world. Anxieties that we take on behalf of Krishna will liberate us. So what, can, what sort of anxiety can we have when we're serving Krishna? A cook, for example, every day he'll want to cook something different for Krishna. He'll be in anxiety. Jayanti, every day she's trying to think about a new theme for Damodar. She's in anxiety. Those anxieties are uh, required in order that we become purified. So anxieties on the spiritual path are actually a necessity. If we, are, if we don't have any worries, material or spiritual, then we should be worried because we should have spiritual anxieties. How can I serve my Lord better? What can I do? How can I stretch myself to please the Lord better? The, the, those anxieties have to be there. If they're not there, we will become very complacent. If there's any questions or comments, please do, uh, do raise them. Anything I'm saying which doesn't make sense or needs clarification. It delivers one from all material pangs. There is a, a, never any question of frustration. Again, this is material frustration. There may be spiritual frustrations. We may not uh, be able to achieve what we want to do in terms of our service to Krishna, but that is purifying we may get a little disheartened or disappointed that I haven't been able to serve my Lord as I would have liked to. That's good. That's really good because that shows a anxiety to serve him better. And that should be there. I want to do better. Devotees uh, never put into the threefold miseries. So they're beyond the threefold miseries, which is Adi Devik, Adi Bodhik, Adi Atmik. Troubles that come from the mind, troubles that come from other living entities, and troubles that come from Mother Nature. The sadhus do not suffer for material miseries. They do not suffer material miseries. So the next theme, Bhakti Yoga versus materialistic path. Devotees find it easy to seek Lord's protection, but unrighteous persons find it difficult. So devotees are naturally, if anything, anything uh, is troubling them, they will just naturally alleviate towards the Lord. But those who are not so righteous, they may find that difficult because they may not have any faith in the Lord. One who fails to please the Lord certainly neglects his own interest. Devotees can only put faith in Lord Krishna as transcendental sense activities, not those under, who are under the control of supernatural forces. So we would only put faith in the Supreme Lord or his devotees and not uh, those who are under Maya. Anyone whose work, religious ritualistic performance and renunciation does not lead to bhakti must be considered dead. <laughs> Although he's breathing, this is quite a heavy statement. But if our endeavors don't lead us to bhakti, then we're wasting time. That's effectively what is being said. So one may go to the temple and uh, have darshan of the deities. But if one is just looking at some 
without any faith, looking at some stone as opposed to the deity, then what is the use? One may, there are many people who take monrat, especially within the Jain community. That's one of the things they do. They don't speak. But if that renunciation of not, of not speaking doesn't lead you to remembering God, then what's the use? Better to speak about God than not to speak. Of course, if you're going to speak nonsense, better not to speak. <laughs> But if one is in on the on the spiritual path, then if you are not speaking, if you're taking a vow of not speaking, like Kapil, uh, was it, no, Kardam Muni, he took the vow of not speaking. That was the age where one uh, attained perfection through uh, meditation and keeping this monrat. But in this age, it's very hard. You're gonna speak something or you're going to have some uh, something to say. So better to speak about God than to speak, uh, to, to not speak and think about nonsense. Bhakti yoga versus Ashtanga yoga. Ashtanga yoga is the physical, um, no, it's both the physical and the mental uh, yogic postures where one tries to Meditate on the Supreme Lord within the heart. Astanga Yoga requires bhakti as an element of success. And this is where that's uh, said. Always merged in devotional service, the Astanga Yogi visualizes the Lord standing, moving, lying down or sitting within him. So bhakti yoga is important in Astanga Yoga. Bhakti yoga versus the Virat Rup worship. Virat Rup is the universal form of the Lord. Worshippers of the Virat Rup don't get liberation if they don't possess bhakti. So you can see, bhakti is again and again and again. So important. Bhakti yoga versus jnana yoga. Bhakti is easy to perform, but other processes, jnana and astanga yoga, involves a lot of pain. And we're reading the 12th chapter every day, Krishna is saying this very point in the 12th chapter. In the first five or six verses, he describes the difference between bhakti yoga and jnana yoga, basically. The four kumaras transformed from impersonalism to personalism by smelling the aroma of lotus, of tulsi from the Lord's lotus feet. This is really powerful. They were great sages. As soon as they were born, they were great sages. But they had this inclination towards the impersonal, the man unmanifested form of the Lord. But when they went to Vaikuntha and they smelt the lotus, the, the tulsi, or, uh, aroma of tulsi from the Lord's lotus feet, they converted. That's all it took. So they were great souls they get, became even greater, either by bhakti or, or by philosophical research. One has to find the same destination as Bhagwan and Brahman, which is nothing but the bodily effulgence of the Lord. Jnana yoga requires bhakti as the element of success. For a jnani, Gyan is basically one who's um, accumulating knowledge. And by the elimination process, he works out what is real, what is not real. And that takes some time. For a Gyani to attain impersonal Brahman, developing bhakti is an element. So even he needs a, uh, the bhakti process. Process of Gyan involves engaging in bhakti with the faith that the Lord is real. Mm. So that's what they try to do. They try to distinguish between what is real and what is unreal through knowledge. Bhakti versus impersonal liberation. Bhakti performed without motive on a spontaneous level, bhav, 
is superior to liberation. Devotees never desire to become one with the Lord. This is very important. We don't want to become one. We want to serve him. Devotees don't accept five kinds of liberation, even though they are offered by the Lord. So these five are like having the same bodily features, etc., uh, etc., et living with the Lord, etc. So this concludes the uh, references to Bhakti Yoga in the third canto. Are there any comments, any, any questions, anything you'd like to share? Hare Krishna, everyone. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Um, my question is maybe on, on yoga, bhakti yoga also, but it's a bit out of our, our, the context we are using right now. Is that okay to, to ask yeah, a question? But, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Okay, so last night I, um, I was having a conversation with someone and uh, he was saying about, um, he's a Shiva, he, he follows Lord Shiva. First he asked me, um, uh, it drew my tour to South India, did I go to um, Coimbatore? I said, yes. And he said, did you go to the Shiva temple? I said, yes, I went. Very nice temple by the sea and uh, how opulent it was. And they were taking Lord Shiva on a golden palanquin to do the parikram of the temple. And, all. and he said, did you go inside? I said, no. And he said, you should have gone inside. You know, there is um, Linga Dhyana. There is this Sadhguru who is um, um, giving some kind of mantras to people who can go in trance and leave their body. And uh, you should have taken to that. And he started talking. I said, look, I didn't go inside the temple because at the time when I reached there, they were doing the parikrama. We pay our obeisances to Lord Shiva and we sat by the sea and uh, our guide was giving a class on Bhagavatam. And he said, and he started talking. He said that, um, our conversation was long, to cut it short. <laughs> he said, um, when, um, he is sure when he leaves his body, he is going to merge into the Lord. Mm. Then I said, no, we don't merge into the Lord. Then I started explaining about Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan, mm. right? The free oh. aspect and what happened and all. And then he said, then um, what happened uh, for all those people like Shishupal, mm. like uh, who merge into the Lord? That, that means that they become one with the Lord. Mm. And I said, no, we, well, the Lord has his separate individual mm. identity and each of us individual, if we manage to reach the goal of Vrindavan, then we will also have our individuality. Then uh, we talk a lot about um, why Paramatma is there, what does Paramatma do? Mm. And I said, Paramatma's job is to accompany us everywhere we go, even we go to hell, he's with us. But as soon as we reach Golok, his job is done, he leaves us. So he's not convinced. He's trying to tell me that, um, yes, we become one with, with the Lord. So uh, this conversation hasn't, hasn't ended. Our time was up, so we have to go further. So how can I explain that um, mm -hmm. even though Shishupal and all the soldiers on the battlefield merge into, um, they could see, but uh, what happened? This, this is a bit I have to clarify with him. So please guide me. Sure. No, thank, thank you for, this is, a, this is a quite a common um, discussion mm -hmm. actually, especially with the, the Bharatiya yeah, and the Bharatiya people. Who, uh, no, he said, he also told me, oh, if you had gone in, because Sadhguru's, um, mm. I don't follow this person. I, I, frankly, I don't like him. So he said his <laughs> wife left, left her body in front of everyone by a yoga process. When I was trying to explain, but then he's adamant that uh, he will merge into the Lord. So mm. what happens when we saw these, um, all the Atma, Sishupal, when the mm. mm -hmm. Rasan Chakra cut his throat, he merged into the, so what happened? Please tell yeah. me. So that's a good point. Now, actually, one thing is uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is very clear. Natvevaham jatunasam, natvam neme janadipa, na chaiva nava, yes. sarvevaya yes. So we are all individual souls. So even mm -hmm. when a, um, um, a yogi may merge with the Supreme Lord, say, forget about Shishupal at the moment, because that's a yes. different topic. Yes. Uh, 
he still remains individual soul in the Brahma Jyoti. He does not lose his consciousness. That still remains with that individual soul. So when you merge with the Lord, um, you, you disappear into this light, but you're still an individual with an individual consciousness. It's just now you've got no activity. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a position of uh, you're suspended uh, in yeah. like midair, which is not the constitutional position of the Atma, because the Atma is always active, active and yeah, wanting to serve. So, uh, so is it the, like they are in the Brahman? Yeah, that's the Brahman. They, would, yes, mm, the Brahma they will come. They will have to come back, right? So I explained. I explained that that there's um, like mm. the sun rays, like the sun disk, and the sun planet. I gave that's uh, it, that's like it. this. So, very good. Um, very good. <laughs> And when I say, I say, if if this yogi, if they they are um, really pure, they might uh, be elevated. Otherwise, they will have yes. to come back to the material world. Not only if they get they association of devotees, they'll get elevated. Yes, yes. Okay. So the point is, why uh, all those people who merge into the Lord, they become one with us? Say no, they don't. Yes. So we end up here, and I have to take it again. I, I don't yeah. know. They don't. Yeah. yeah, I just think because the analogy would be like if you take the ocean, which is yes. uh, you know a, a lot of water. Yes. But if you look at each uh, individual molecule or atom in there, that mm -hmm. that's that's like the the little souls making up that whole. Uh, mm -hmm. The whole is Krishna, and we are mm -hmm. you know part part of that uh, as as the molecules or the or the atoms in there. Mm -hmm. So that's, I was that, like I, that's like an analogy that he might understand. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I I also told him like okay, let's see the sun is shining, and there is a pond of water and a pond of urine. Yeah. The sun mm -hmm. will absorb both. Both. It mm -hmm. will not distinguish. Good. Oh, oh, your Very. urine. I will not absorb you. If, similarly, the rain when it falls, it doesn't say oh the sea has got lots of water. The river mm -hmm. I would not fall. It falls everywhere, right? But it is. They don't become. They don't. They are not contaminated. Even though the sun absorbs the urine, the sun doesn't uh, get um, contaminated, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm putting all this point forward, but just a bit that how come these demons they merge into the Lord? That that means that they become one with the Lord. Well, Shishupal's situation was, of course, we know, right? He is uh, Jain Vijay, one of those two. Yes. And yes. Uh, he when he went into the Lord. It didn't mm -hmm. mean he merged with the Lord. He attained the Vaikuntha planets. Yes. Uh, his original constitutional position. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the vast majority of, like everybody in Braj, who Krishna yes. did, they attained Golok, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not even yeah, it's like It's like, it's like um, Krishna is taking the soul and putting in Golok. That's it. That's a merging in Krishna. Mm -hmm. I, I need to have some... Um, like mundane things to explain to him because he will he will mm. not understand because I have given um, like um, analogy from Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam and all this but that doesn't click into his mind because he follows of Shiva he's telling uh, no he will merge into Lord Shiva and he will leave his body I said that's good if you want to do it go ahead do it but uh, yeah. don't and he's also saying that um, something like Aham Brahma Asmi. Yes, that's right. That's what they yes, say. Yes, he's using that. He's using that. I say, no, that is only Krishna. That is nobody else. Yes, that's a Vedic but, term, actually. Aham mm -hmm. I, I, I am Brahman. Yeah. But yeah. what they misunderstand is, well, uh, we had this argument. I had this argument with, in front of Guru Maharaj with uh, mm -hmm. somebody on the train. For, and that was, went on for hours. In the end, mm -hmm. I just had to tell yeah. him, you want to become one with God? Well, you know what? I want to become better than God. I'm going to become even more powerful than God, right? And then we had the picture of uh, Yeshua. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, who, and I asked him, who's more powerful here? The person who's running or the ones who's got the stick in the hand? So he had to admit this one in the stick in the hand because the person who's running is scared. But the person who's running is scared is God. The one who's after him is a devotee. So uh, you might want to become God, but I'm going to become better than God. <laughs> and I, I had to we had yeah. to stop the conversation because otherwise we're just wasting our time yes and we are going just round and round and coming to nowhere so 
our time also was up yesterday. So um, <laughs> I was, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I, I, at the end I told him, I was so adamant. I said, okay, you want to merge into the Lord? He said, yes, yes, I want to know what is there, what is happening. Nothing, okay. that's the problem. <laughs> yes, so I said, okay, you will experience it, don't worry. So when you leave this body, then you will experience it. For now, let's not talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Prabhuji. Thank yes, you. I just it's, want un, it's unfortunate. Uh, there are people like that. And I think you're right, Mother. You just have to say to them, okay, enjoy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let us, let, send us a post, send us an email when you're up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we can prepare ourselves, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. Thank you, Mother. <laughs> it's a good point to discuss. We can quickly go over these reversals. Um, we saw in the third canto, there were many devotees who had problems, right? Vidur, Diti, Jay and Vijay, um, Devhuti, Brahma, specifically. So just sort of uh, looking at uh, their problem and what their response was and what they learned from it. So Vidur's problem was he was insulted and he was banished pretty much from the kingdom by Duryodhan, the insolent little boy. Mm -hmm. And his response, he considered these acts, what happened to him, part of Lord's Maya that he had to suffer. And he went on pilgrimage. So that was the perfect response, right? He didn't uh, blame anybody. He didn't uh, go into depression, um, et cetera, oh, battery, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He just decided to make use of the situation in the best possible way and to go on pilgrimage. And in many ways, um, we've sort of got the same sort of issue going on right now. We've sort of been banished, if you like, from living our normal lives because of this virus thing. You know, you're sort of locked down, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, instead of, and, uh, instead of blaming someone like maybe China or, you know, Boris or some or, or whoever, we can just take um, oh, God. <laughs> blaming God. Yeah. We just take responsibility and say, okay, look, that's where we are. It's okay. Um, let's make the most of the situation while we can. And luckily, you know, we are able to sort of a little bit uh, engage ourselves in sort of some sort of bhakti. So that's, that's good. And what devotees see the hand of the Lord in all situations. So we should see this as a, a, a some, this virus thing as something, as a gift from God, because it is a gift from God. Um, you know, ultimately we, you know, there's gonna be some virus that's gonna get us one day because we have this material body. So, but, this particular vice is giving us the opportunity to become more Krishna conscious, and that's fantastic. So Vidur did, he went on the pilgrimage and um, then he met Udav and Maitreya. So he really made the most of it. Diti, due to sex at the uh, inauspicious time, she gave birth to two demons, right? Real, real de reversal, real problem. But she wasn't a bad person, of course. She was uh, one of the original uh, females who came into this world. She re repented her mistake. You know, she begged for forgiveness also from uh, uh, Kashyap. And although her sons were to be demons, because of her repentant nature, her, her, and um, you know, she, she sought uh, shelter of Lord Shiva, who she was a great devotee of, her grandson would be a great devotee. And the grandson made up for everything because that was Prahlad. And even the Lord becomes enchanted by Prahlad. He's such a great devotee. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would constantly be talking about Prahlad. The gurus would constantly be talking about Prahlad. Due to her proper deliberation and repentance, she got a benediction that gave her some solace. But that solace was phenomenal because this very few devotees like Prahlad in, in existence, you know, in the material world at least. Jain Vijay, what was their reverse? So they were cursed by the four Kumaras, take birth as demons in the material world. Now, what did they do? They took responsibility, they accepted the curse, 
but they simply prayed, let me not forget the Lord, even there, even in the material world. And what did the Lord do? He benedicted them that they will return within a short period of time. So this very much applies to us because God knows what pains this body and our karma will give us in the future. God knows. So we should always have this prayer in our mind. Let me know, never forget you, my Lord. Let me never forget you. Because if we don't forget him, then let it, whatever comes, we can deal with it. Because the Lord will be there with us to deal, help us deal with it. Devahuti, what was her reversal? She had the daughters and her husband wanted to leave and take sannyas. <laughs> so she asked, what was her response? She said, make me fearless. And of course, that effectively may, meant, give me a son. Because <laughs> the son takes care of the uh, mother when the husband is gone. But of course, the son left as well. But the son was the Supreme Personality of Godhead who bestowed fearlessness on Devahuti and gave her the knowledge to attain him. So Kadam tells her that the Lord will soon appear in her womb and the Lord enlightens her. That was the result of everything. And finally she achieves the Lord. So that reversal gave her the impetus to achieve the Lord. And Brahma, he had so many reversals. If you can number them one after the other, so five, six, there's more than this, but I ended, I, I, I couldn't uh, carry on after this. So he was firstly disappointed because he couldn't trace out the root of the universal, uh, the flower, the lotus flower, actually. Not lotus feet, lotus flower. So what is his response? He concentrated his mind on the Supreme Lord. And what happened? He, uh, he ceased personal endeavor to focus on the Lord. And that's the beginning of bhakti, which will lead us to the Lord. So we, we have to sometimes leave our personal agendas and try to focus on the Lord. And that will take us to the Lord. So in this world, we can be in an undying, an, an unending uh, workload of just material things, just pile, list, piles and piles and piles. Sometimes we just have to say, okay, you know, enough is enough and focus on the Lord. Uh, second thing he was affected by was dissatisfied because he was creating the ignorance around him. And he purified himself by meditating on the Lord and he created the four Kumaras. Okay. Yeah, he created the four Kumaras, that's right. So the lesson from this, he, he created because it was his duty to create the ignorance, but devotees don't like to see others in, in illusion. So that's why he was unsatisfied. And that's why he created the four Kumaras. But the four Kumaras, that was the third problem. They defied him. They said they would not populate the world because that's what he needed at that time. And at that time, his response, he got angry, but he tried to control his anger, although Rudra was born from his eyebrows. So he didn't express the anger as he knew that the four Kumaras were spiritually advanced. So that was good, he controlled himself. Another fourth reversal, he was disturbed as Rudra's progeny began to destroy the creation and attacked him. <laughs> so he asked Rudra to stop generating living entities and engage in penance. So immediately he saw the problem and he addressed it. And Brahma advised Rudra, don't destroy, do your job at the time when it's needed at the end of, uh, uh, when the time for dissolution comes. And that persuaded Rudra to do that. He was distracted by his daughter. And what did he do? He gave up that uh, body, that mentality, because he has a subtle body and we have to be careful that thinking wrongly leads to fall down. Mm. So we have to be careful with our thoughts. If we're thinking down the wrong route, then we will be ending up acting down that wrong uh, route. 
the sixth thing that impacted him was um, he was disrupted by the lusty demons who wanted sex even with him. <laughs> so he he absorbed himself in contemplation, and then he was advised by the Lord um, to give up his body. So this is the thing that devotees do. When they're faced with problems, they surrender to the Lord and the Lord gives directions how to get out of that danger. So these are the reversals that various, um, which we can learn from basically. Any, any comments, any questions from that? So there, I think um, we might be at the end of the Bhagavad, the um, tenth, the third canto. Might just do one verse uh, from the Bhagavatam uh, next week, and then we move into the fourth canto. Um, unless anybody else wants to do anything on the third canto, uh, because the third canto is one of the most important cantos from a philosophical point of view. It gives us a lot of um, um, theoretical understanding about the Supreme Lord. But if there's anything that anybody would like to discuss in a little bit more detail of the third canto, we certainly can do that. There's no need to rush into the next uh, canto until we are satisfied with the third canto. Okay. Um, in that case, if nobody's got any comments, we can go into the Nishinga um, Kavach. Let me just... Uh...